Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hello, welcome to this webinar at 31st of Jan 2023. So I'm just trying to moderate here today with my team over here with our events director, Rosanna, uh, Irene, Bhavin, and all of my events team together. Uh, we are going to wait for some time initially. Let the other people just join us on time and then we'll begin with some more minutes to seven. So stay tuned. We'll be back here itself. Okay, we can can go ahead. We can go ahead. So good evening once again, all the PMI chapter webinar attendees, fellow colleagues, dear participants. My name is Anshul, and I'm going to be your host and moderator today for today's webinar. We are yet here with our another interesting topic and our honored speaker along with us. First of all, let me hand it over to Rosanna, our events director, to just do a quick introduction, and then we will take it over from there. Over to you, Rosanna. Thank you, Anshal. And what a month it has been. We've started off with our annual gathering, and this is our second webinar of the year, all in January, and January is not ending wow. anymore. <laughs> so it's the last day yeah. of January. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I won't be taking much of your time, but my name is Rosanna. I am the PMI UAE Events Director, and I have the team here. Uh, back end waiting for all your questions. I'll begin with Bavin, Olomidi, Irene is supporting Anshal on moderating. And thank you, Anshal. I'm going to give you the floor. Good luck. And uh, Dr. Taig, welcome. And we're looking forward to hearing your uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna. Thanks a lot. I appreciated your quite good introduction to begin with. So before I hand over to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Taig, for the presentation, some housekeeping items I would like to introduce and uh, be expected from our webinar. This will be near about an hour and 15. Uh, before we launch <clears throat> our webinar topic, uh, allow me to give you a brief introduction about our PMI UA chapter. 
Following this in presentation, we will have a short time for as well, where Dr. Thayek will do our best with me to accommodate all the questions within the time frame. We encourage all of you to really post all your thoughts <clears throat> on the chat and interact with us to make this webinar as useful and as interactive as possible. In regard to your question and answers regarding the webinar topic, please post them to an A section. This will allow Irene to really collate it well and to hand it over to me with the time frame. I will also give you a heads up, Dr. Thai, when, how, with how many questions we are expecting in case so that we can manage them in time. So allow me to share my screen quickly just to let our audience go back and then have a look at our PMI UA chapter. Here I go. Here, okay. Okay, so here we go. So today we are this webinar with the topic of leading with purpose <clears throat> and with our leadership expert, Dr. Thai over there. So about the webinar, we are doing this as a part of the Project Management Institute. We are the world leader who work with our behalf to advance the project management as a practice and worldwide. As a part of the chapter introduction, uh, our chapter is the country chapter with the US-based Project Management Institute, which 100% run by volunteers only. We are proud to take the, to the point of effort there. We are in the top five chapters overall in global way in terms of number of members. And also we are growing every day. We are passionate about this practice of project management as a profession and personal development and networking and education. We are also dependent on all of you to make these chapter activities as interactive and as engaging as possible. So please contribute your activities through your interesting talks and presentation questions, corporate sponsorship, and help us out as a volunteer. Here are some quick snips of the latest annual gathering, what we had recently, give you a glimpse over there, with Dr. Uh, President over there as well. So this is our board. Uh, as you can see, Dr. Reda is our president, and then rest of the directors as well, showing up for your reference. Here we go. So in 2023, we are in the new year now. So we have advanced benefits with the PMI uh, in terms of networking, knowledge sharing, career growth, and events. This particular webinar, which we are doing at the moment, is the part of the events pillar under the diversified webinar section. Our silver sponsors, Dubai Properties and Miras, and our collaboration partners are here for your reference as well, who help us in all their support and with the speakers. Video information. So as we all, most of the people must be aware, this webinar serves you with two strategic previews, which will be automatically credited back to your PMI account. Uh, and it will take about near about four weeks to get them deposited in your account over there. Any chance you don't see your PDUs awarded, please drop us an email at info at pmi.ua.org. And also please try to engage with the panelists in our chat and at QA. Find out more information about upcoming webinar sessions, please visit our website at pmiua.org. And of course, we have a lot of social media channels around us, which help us always to be on toes and be engaged as much as we can. Here we go. Uh, let me introduce quickly uh, with our... presenter now, allow me to give for Dr. Thaig over there. So Dr. Thaig is a humongous experience actually with a lot of things, including executive development, leadership training, and executive coach. Uh, he has joined in September 2020 as a senior specialist in leadership development program where he's responsible to implement and design new frameworks around leadership development, along with Adnog Group Operating Company. He has devised four fundamental programs, strategic influencing, presenting literacy, media training, and transitioning to enterprise leadership as well. Previously, he has worked as a senior advisor, as executive development at NOC Onshare, and also from the headquarters. He has also worked heavily with INSEAD, Howard, London Business Schools, and other prestigious universities, uh, business schools, in terms of co-designing and delivering a range of learning initiatives uh, for the numerous clients. He has delivered a lot of executive courses, and definitely 
we will be getting benefit from those some of the learnings today in this webinar. Uh, he has also presented in a few of the international conferences as a published author as well. So that was a brief intro from our esteemed speaker. Uh, of course, I will not take much more time to keep you engaged there, and I will hand over the floor to Dr. Thai over there to take us through the purpose with leadership. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Anshal. Have you enabled me to allow me to um, share? I think, yes, you can try yes. it. Yes, Dr. Thai, your uh, sharing is enabled. Okay, thank you very much, Ancho. Um, tonight's content is predominantly based on a wonderful, wonderful book called Become by Mark Hannum. And it has to do with the five commitments of purposeful leadership. So as stated, there are five commitments needed for one to become a purposeful leader. To inspire, provide hope and inspiration towards a future vision. To engage, offer opportunities to contribute and to thrive at work. To innovate, drive new thinking and creative freedom, create success. To achieve, create appropriate structure and clarity to achieve a successful outcome. And finally, to become, to be able to lead with commitment, courage, compassion, and self-awareness. Now, the purpose of inspiring is to encourage others. The purpose of engage is to include others. The purpose of innovate is to chart new paths. The purpose of achieve, to get consistent results towards organizational targets. Now, highly valued leaders drive the organization through vision, strategy, and goals. The value of a leader is in his or her capability to create, to articulate, to energize, to align people, and to actualize the aspirations, i.e. the vision, the mission, the strategy, the goals and objectives of any organization. In other words, leaders lead around the purpose. Leaders own the goal, the aspirations of the organization. They don't need to always create them, but they need to own them and create a path and the plan to achieve them. The best leaders are guided by their own sense of purpose and how it aligns with the organizational mission. Their beliefs is their purpose their why. So purposeful leadership leaders are they're, they're full, thoughtful, careful, hopeful. Purpose is the effective leader's tool. Now, a couple of quotes here from a wonderful gentleman. Unfortunately, he's not with us any longer. He died in 2014, Warren Bennett. Now, Warren Bennis was one of the world's leading experts on leadership. Professor Bennis was a lecturer, consultant, and a writer. He was also chief advisor to four US presidents. And some wonderful quotes here on really what purposeful leadership and engagement is all about. As he states on the left, good leaders make people feel that they're at the very heart of things, not at the periphery. A true leader not only cares about their own success, but the success and empowerment of others. And I love this one, which is a world-renowned quote of his. Failing organizations are usually overmanaged and underled. So let's take a deeper look into engagement. Now we've got three people here. I'm sure you recognize all three. Greta Thunberg, Martin Luther King, and Gandhi. So just let's take Greta Thunberg for a moment. Now, as you're aware, Greta, the teenager from Sweden, has become a real symbol of environmental activism. She engages with a purpose. She has studied as much about climate change as most adults knowledgeable about the subject. 
she speaks with clarity and force about the crisis and solutions. She role models a sustainable life. She's candid. She has faced criticism, resistance, and pressure, even from her own parents. All the while, her movement has engaged people in 71 countries and over 700 different cities. Now, she has no organization and no subordinates, but she has her followers, people who want the same goal as she does and feel empowered to act. She leads with focus and purpose. A similar story is true of the other people, Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Now, do you have a purpose that inspires and communicates to others? Engagement is often described as the way people bring themselves to the mission, the vision, and the values of an organization. It is the employee's commitment and connection to the organization. So let's look at the levels of engagement. There are different levels of engagement each of us can have at work. When people are engaged above the dotted line, they tend to volunteer their highest efforts and energies. These levels include creative excitement, heartfelt commitment, and willing cooperation. You can't buy these levels of engagement from team members, but as a leader, you can create conditions where team members want to give of their best. Doesn't it feel good to work in the levels outlined in the blue zone? Now let's look at the three levels below the dotted line. When people are at these levels, they're choosing not to engage. Indifferent compliance is where people do what is required without passion or enthusiasm. You do it because you were told to do it. Resentful obedience. This is where people obey because you have the power to punish them if they don't. They do the minimum that is required and may not do it well. In the rebel or quit zone, people refuse, they push back, they challenge assignments, or psychologically quit. They show up at work, but they don't care about things. The level of engagement we operate from is a choice each of us makes. In reality, we've all probably experienced each of these from time to time. Now, I love Franklin Covey's definition of an engaged employee. An engaged employee is a valued member of a winning team doing meaningful work in an environment of trust where there's lots of psychological safety. Now, to be fully engaged, you have to engage the mind, the body, the heart, and the spirit. Now, the following are some good questions a leader may ask him or herself. Do you make your subordinates feel comfortable about speaking up? Do you know what makes your people tick? Do you find common ground with your subordinates? Do you make sure all your employees are included and valued? Do you make sure all voices are heard? Do you get insights from different perspectives? Do you give your employees challenges and stretch opportunities? Do you expose your team to a wide variety of opportunities? Now let's look at the second commitment, inspire. We have enough of people who tell it like it is. Now we could use a few people who tell it like it could be. Now, here we've got to lead from purpose, inspiring. You have to be optimistic, provide hope. Use the language of leadership, what I call proactive language, strategic thinking, goals and vision, role model. 
Are you doing what you say you'll do? Be vulnerable. Show courage. Now, I'd like for you to put in the chat box any other characteristics or behaviors you would see that are necessary for a leader to inspire. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes and then, Chell, you might call out what's, what's put in the chat box, please. Yes, so we have some here. I said uh, walk the talk. Others is about integrity, realistic, empathy, uh, becoming a servant to enable team to progress. Uh, empathy again, they said we need care. Uh, focus, empathy again. I think a, lot, a number of uh, participants have already mentioned empathy. Be supportive, lead by example, or walk the talk. Trust, empowerment, uh, charismatic personality, compassion, trusting, a servant leader, a good listener, volunteer in team building. So they're looking at leaders to be volunteering as well in team building. Uh, forecasting risk, mentoring, and uh, I think there's a lot more here. Dr. Tai, 32, 33 messages. <laughs> Supportive, vision, awareness, leading with example, respect and appreciation to others, concern, coaching, communicator. Uh, I think good leaders focus on the strengths of the team member rather than their weaknesses. This is from Kabis. Uh, they look for a, a leader who's mentoring, Egglosnessness, I don't know what this means. Egglosness, a strong mentor, influencer. Oh, that more. I, um, there's some more. 47, Dr. Tig. Lovely, lovely, Irene. We've got a very switched on group tonight. Yes. Check my, they could take my place here very, very easily. Two, two things kind of came across there to me. Um, servant leadership, which is, I, I, I think, fantastic, and, and also trust, because I think. Trust is bedrock. Without trust, you have nothing in it. And trust is based on, on character and competence. Your character is all about your integrity and your intent. Your competence all about capability, delivering results. So wonderful. Thank you for those comments. Much appreciated. So as a purposeful leader, you have to provide hope and inspiration for the future and direct energy towards a bold vision. Messages of hope, ladies and gentlemen, are contagious and they're uplifting. Inspiring involves an endless process of tuning, refining, um, editing, and shaping. We can inspire others in many ways, and you've, you've alluded to this, as a role model, showing courage in a situation that others find difficult or being vulnerable in front of others. The leader needs to inspire others in order to achieve a goal and vision. He, need, he or she needs to communicate that goal or vision. The more inspiring the language, the more effective the communication. The vision that leaders create must be for something bigger than themselves, pertaining again to servant leadership. The vision must be about making things better for a collective or a community or an organization not just for the leader. The vision must be ethical and positive. Visions must be optimistic and must be about a common goal. Being able to create a vision and then anchor it in goals and direction is a key practice of a purposeful leader. Strategic thinking is very, very, very important for a purposeful leader. It is the one skill that stands out regarding a leader's capability to create a vision. Strategic thinking also ties into the fundamental skills of any and every leader, which in my opinion are judgment and decision making. You have to lead from your purpose. So I would urge you to ask yourself questions like this when you're thinking about the commitment of inspiration. Do you get people excited with your vision? Do your plans leave people knowing exactly what they need to do? Do you keep talk about purpose 
and strategy interesting? Do you keep important messages short and sweet? Do you keep others' needs in mind, not their wants, their needs? Do you provide a clear vision of future success and results? Do you help people and teams overcome hurdles? Now, the third commitment we're going to look at here is innovate. I love this one. I advice from himself, Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Now, the primary outcome of quality leadership, in my opinion, is change. Leaders create change. Innovation keeps a company competitive, scanning the world, the economy, your industry, and your competitors is paramount. Developing an inspiring goal for innovation is perhaps the differentiator. Great goals change everything. Whether or not purposeful leaders are innovative or creative themselves is unimportant. They understand and are able to set goals around the right place to spark innovation. And there are three primary factors involved in innovation. First, explore and navigate opportunities. Whether or not purposeful leaders are innovative or creative themselves, as I said, is not important. It's clearing the ground for others to start the innovation. Change the game and then lead the change. There's never a time when the world is not changing. Yes, there will be resistance to change. You have to be more communicative more often regarding your vision and your goals. You have to just not own the vision, but you must also own the drumbeat and the sense of urgency around the change. Be the role model for the change. Master the use of symbols and how you act, how you communicate. Be the truth leader. Be honest about challenges of implementation. Express your belief in success because of the people who will be involved. And eliminate the games that people can and do play during change. Leading is creating change. Now, these true research are why change fails. The top five reasons when implementing change. Leaders often, they don't have the skill set to take the team through the change. If people aren't clear on the desired results of the change and why it's a benefit, then there's not enough push for them to make the change work. Typically, leaders under communicate change. To really understand something, you need to hear it about at least six times. And I'll repeat that. To really understand something, you need to hear it at least six times. Also, don't forget to engage in two way communication about the change. Often, organizational changes haven't been thought through enough. They need to align with the company's vision and the company's mission. When we don't spend enough time talking to people about what the change means for them, they will avoid or resist it rather than embrace and adapt to it. Now, this is a lovely change model, again, presented by Franklin Covey. And if you see, you have two dimensions here. You've got time on the horizontal line, and you've got results on the vertical line. And there are four zones that, that, that break up the time. Now, when we're implementing change, especially made change, we go through these four zones. The first zone is the zone of status quo. People are content, they're happy, but change will happen. It is inevitable. 
Now, when change arises, usually people in the organization go into what's called the zone of disruption. Then they have to reach a point of decision. What do we do here? They adopt and finally they get to innovation. Now in this model, you as a leader need to get your people out of the dip, the disruption and adoption as soon and as quickly as possible. Because when you're in the dip, you're costing the company money and time is money. So what I'd like you to do in the chat box now is let's go through these four zones and what would you do as a leader? What do you think you, you should do as a leader in each of these zones? So let's first start with the zone of status quo. What do you need to do in this zone? We give you a couple of moments and Irene, you might just call out what's put in the chat, please. Yeah, sure. So Dr. Tai, just to clarify, you you wanted us to identify what we will do in each area of uh, the zone, leader, no? As a leader, what would you do in each zone? We'll just take okay. zone by zone. So okay, the now zone we are of status quo. The status quo. What would you okay. do as a leader? As a leader in the status quo, there is a focus, have clarity of purpose and take action. Repetition is important. You need to inspire, investigate what needs to be improved, analyze and assess, encourage the people to think outside the box, focus and developing a team that is in the status quo, organize and as assemble, challenge the team, inspire the team, Someone says, challenge myself, take out of my comfort zone and accomplish a task. Look for opportunity, communicate the why of change is key. Opportunity, look for opportunity for change, highlight the problems, communicate the change to be made, that is in the status quo, okay? Communicate to all members, align with vision and communication, Focus, listen, understand, analyze, create urgency. Inspire, lead to outcome, to come out of their comfort zone, and many more. Doctor, we have 34 Lovely. still messages. Wonderful, I wonderful, have Karina, wonderful. Yeah, in this zone of status quo, you know, the change is going to happen. What you need to do here is get your people ready for the change. Look for opportunities, as somebody stated. Identify the benefits of the change. I think that's very, very important. And of course, first identify the why. And I think a lot of leaders, this is where they fall down. They don't give people a clear why are we implementing this change. Communicate, very, very important. And I think and nobody touched on this one, but I would also put in there, consider the thoughts and the feelings of your employees as they're about to go through the change might also be worth considering. Okay. Can you take zone two here, the zone of disruption? Now we're gone into the dip. Our results have dropped. So what would you do here? What do you think you should do as a leader in the zone of disruption to get people out of the zone as quickly as possible? Out of the disruption zone as quickly as possible. It says uh, coach the people, empower, Distribution, encourage and train, clear communication, communicate the advantages of the change, identify the reasons for the change. In this stage, leaders must take bold and decisive action to bring about the change. They must create a sense of uh, urgency, understand the challenges, understand the needs, and listen better for implementation, train and coach, be mindful of impact resulted from the disruption, monitor the progress, listen to new ideas, align and mental roadmap from as is to where to go, uh, focus the problem on the problem statement, challenge ideas, be innovative, motivate and educate. And effective communication again, communication has been mentioned a number of times, reassurance of the team, maybe this the, the empathy part of uh, the leader, be patient, training and support, motivate and coach, fail fast and forward, positive mm -hmm. impact, 
Yeah, so a lot more, Doctor. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you. Hit a lot of them there. Yeah. And Can we have a very uh, participative audience here. Thank you for all of your uh, inputs here in the chat. Yeah, yeah. In in this zone, Irene, I would say, yeah, you, you need to keep communicating, as, as stated, because that is your connecting thread throughout the whole lot. Um, I'd see feedback here, and I think that's very, very important because that will engage people. See their feedback. And remember, I said, an engaged person is someone who is valued. Um, stay the course. And this is where a lot of people give up. You are going to hit the downwards and you're going to slide downwards. But, you know, stay the course. You, you have to stay positive. And I think this is the zone really where a leader earns their stripes. Help the team members because they will emotionally face problems, you have to help them. You have to give them that one-on-one that, that -on -one type of feedback, maybe small group meetings with them. Find your change catalyst. Find the person who is, who is the good person on your team that can promote the change. And I would also recommit to action. Be very, very important. Yeah, the zone of adoption. Could you write in the chat for the zone of adoption? What might you do as a leader in this zone? Well, someone immediately said, maintain the momentum, adapt for the change and lead the team, stay true to the goal. Mm, do we have any other input there? Okay, communicate the change decision clearly, concisely and frequently. Must provide support and training, communicate the benefits of the changes and be patient and persistent in this stage. Be the cheerleader. Okay, when everyone's like uh, going down, control and monitor, implement the change and monitor, praise and promote the quick adoption members. I want your comment on this, Doctor. Okay, praise and promote the quick adoption members. Establish new systems, fail fast and try and experiment. Clarify, adapt the situation and achieve the target. Offer direction, maybe to those who are still confused. Recognize and reward, another thing that you may want to connect, comment later, doctor. Accelerate the change, facilitate, adapt quickly, communicate effectively, be quick, prepare to adopt, praise and celebrate the achievements, motivate the team, communicate and monitor again, appreciation, remove impediments, and many others, doctor. Yeah, I love, I love one in particular. And I was hoping somebody would pick up on it, and, and they did. And that's celebrate, because it, it's very, very important to celebrate those early wins. Because now your dip, as you can see, is beginning to, to move upwards. You're beginning to come out of the dip. So you do need to celebrate those early wins. It will increase motivation in this path. I, I, but also learn from your mistakes. Very, very important thing to do here, because you are going to make mistakes. How could you have come out of the zone of disruption quicker? Did you learn from the mistakes maybe you made? You have to recommit. And I would urge you here to keep a compelling scoreboard. And if you can put the ownership of the scoreboard with your employees, not with the management, let the employees take ownership of the scoreboard. Let them be as imaginative as they want, create a scoreboard they want, because when they have skin in the game, that's when they will get engaged. That's when they will get committed. So keep that scoreboard and make sure the scoreboard is placed in the office where everybody can see it. Because there is nothing like getting your people on board when they can see the graph and the chain improving. That's what I might say you, you could consider doing for that particular zone. And finally, now we're in the zone of innovation. What might we do as a leader in this zone? Um, they said, encourage to continue to innovate, foster a culture of change, of creativity, and encourage to take calculated risks. Innovation, think out of the box. Promote creativity, this is an innovation. So it's like when they have adopted, they will innovate, start innovating. Identify the team and complement open for feedback, monitor control and improve. Appreciation, Doctor, um, you mentioned earlier, it's to celebrate, but also 
appreciation now is coming in. Be open to new ideas because this is about innovation. Rewards is coming in again. Be hungry for more. Encourage yeah, new I like ideas. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Again. Identify okay. risks and opportunities and reward is coming in again. I think um, in the adoption and disruption part, you mentioned about celebrating. Maybe what I'm seeing here, because I've read rewards a number of times, it's mm. like after you have celebrated, it's time of going to innovation and rewarding the innovators. Okay, reward yeah. system again, improve, document the lessons learned, build proper culture, better use of changes, appreciate new idea. Make new models and describe your idea. And our uh, audience are very active here, much more, a lot more, Doctor. Delegate, accelerate, complement and reward, display achievements. Yeah, rewards came in a lot, uh, Irene, uh, as you said there. And uh, I'd be very careful with rewards because if you keep rewarding every change you bring about, then that could become an expectation. And that's not what you want. Um, because if then a second change comes about and you don't, or a third and fourth change, and now you don't reward people, their motivation might begin to dip a little bit. So in this zone of innovation, yeah, celebrate, definitely celebrate. Success. Envision a better performance from where you are. I would seek feedback again here, and a two-way feedback. Have, have kind of group meetings, have individual meetings, find out what worked, what didn't work as we went through this change cycle. Commit. And I think a very, very important one here is, is to build the capabilities for the next change. Because now is the time to reflect. Don't get comfortable. Okay, celebrate, but, but now look, okay, were we lacking capacity in, in, in some area? Um, because for me to sustain high performance, there are I would consider eight ingredients to sustain performance and purpose that we're talking about today, values, I would say belief, have a performance focus, have inspiration, communication, support and continuous improvement. Because to me, when you've got those eight components in the mix, you're going to have a fantastic sustained high performance outcome. And if you take one away and leave the other seven, for example, you take away purpose, well, now you're going to be aimless. You take away values out of the equation, and you're not going to have any trust. You take belief out of it, and it could lead to anxiety. Take your performance focus out, and then, well, where's your drive? Your drive might be gone. You take out inspiration, and now you've got wasted potential. Take out communication, and without communication, I guarantee you, you'll have chaos. You take out support, and support is, is a common thread throughout here, because if you don't give people support as you're going through change, it could lead to stress. And you take out your continuous improvement, well, then where's your growth going to come for, from? And you have to manage the tensions, I think, in any change, because you know, you're dealing with the current, you're dealing with the future, you're dealing with continuity, with change. You're dealing short term right now, but you have to think long term. Your stability as opposed to flexibility, maybe control right now as opposed to discretion, convergence right now where you're looking for divergence. So in this final zone of, of innovation, I think, yes, celebrate, envision the better performance, commit, and, and definitely Build your capabilities. Fourth commitment in becoming um, a purposeful leader. And I love this quote by, by John F. Kennedy. I believe this goal by John F. Kennedy, not quote, it's goal. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Now, this was in the early 1960s. So he wanted somebody on the moon by the end of the 60s. Now, achievement is all about accomplishing successful outcomes and delivering excellence by creating appropriate structure and clarity. But what the leadership team, now, for this, 
Kennedy himself, there was there was not a single member of John F. Kennedy's leadership team capable of engineering the US into space. But what the leadership team could do was structure success. And what Kennedy did was he set the goal and restructured the current state so the goal could be achieved. They reacted to the goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s and returning him home safely to Earth by generating new government structures, infused the whole initiative with talent. He created cross-governmental communication and cooperation, created an international network of support from other countries, and built momentum by aggressively focusing NASA on landing a man on the moon by defunding the majority of its other initiatives. Now, Kennedy could easily have tried to micromanage the whole enterprise. Instead, he committed fully to taking everything else he could off NASA's plate to let NASA focus its activities on the goal. And he made sure NASA had everything it needed to succeed. Now, highly effective leaders understand the need to multiply achievements and accelerate momentum, but also understand it is done by multiplying the number of leaders involved in accomplishing the goal. Leaders who know what they are doing build collectives of leaders. When leaders set an aspirational goal, it is tantamount to success that they need to change up what's happening now in the present. They delegate power and responsibility. They make sure that things are done and coordinated with other things. They establish structure. They establish boundaries to keep things working and progressing. So highly effective leaders know who needs to work with whom, on different types of challenges an organization faces. Structure also includes how often you're going to have a business review or an accountability session on the initiative. So establishing structure is all about the goal, the people, the reporting, the capital, and the processes and systems. And finally, we're on to our final commitment, which is to become. And here again, we're closing the circle and we're going back to our friend Warren Bennett. All great leaders evidence four basic qualities that are central to their ability to lead. Adaptive capacity, the ability to engage, a distinctive voice, and unshakable integrity. So I urge you to grow with determination compassion, self-awareness, and courage. Human capital drives financial capital, and it's not the other way around, ladies and gentlemen. And to me, there are four human-centric practices that are central to becoming a purposeful leader. First, self-awareness, the capability to understand and leverage yourself in working with people, teams, and organizations. Second, respect. The capability to bring out the best in others by focusing on their talents, their feelings, their interests. Above all, it is a deep respect for every individual. Third, courage. The willingness to show yourself and your values regarding of risk to speak truth, speak truth to power, and to be bold in your vision. And fourth, commitment. The sense of high personal responsibility, hard work, determination, and personal discipline while working for success. Because commitment is about being the role model. If you feel good about who you are, it will radiate, I guarantee you.
So to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, on this webinar, I urge you, radiate your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thai. I think it was very inspiring. It was very inspiring, thoroughly engrossed. A lot of inputs uh, from different context approaches which you have explained. I was trying to absorb them all, but yep, I think I have some words basically, again, when I was talking about leadership, for example, that say that if you don't want to be a good leader, but want to be a great leader, so what does it differentiate between good and the great leaders? Okay, so that is, I think many people have this question in their mind, but let me start with this fundamental question. If you can answer me, it will be really great. What is a big difference which you can point out between a good leader and a great leader? Well, I think if you, if you use those five commitments, be the best you can be, be honest, be open, be full of integrity, be yourself. Um, don't try to be somebody else. And we all have visions of, oh, I wish I was like somebody else. No, be your authentic self. Be the best you can be with skill. Okay. Okay. That's interesting that be yourself will take you to the greatness level. We have another question from one of our audience here, Mr. Kabir, is that how a leader fails? What could be the main reasons of the failure? Mention three of them if you can. Here's okay. of you explained it, but yeah, reiterate. I would say listening, and to me, um, empathic listening um, is, is the deepest form of listening, and I, I think people don't listen enough, and it, it always amazes me. We were given two ears and one mouth. Why don't we use them in that proportion? So I would say listening is a key one, and a second one, why they fail, ego. I think mm. ego is, is a big thing for, for, for leaders to fail. Um, they think they know all the answers to all the questions. And if you're a very, very, very smart leader, hire people who are smarter than you. I because I, I think as a leader, we, we go through various phases. And I call these the six Qs of leadership. You've got IQ and TQ, your IQ and your technical. And these are quotients. Those IQs and TQ will get you into a company. They get you hired. How qualified you are how bright you are. Your motivation and your experience will get you promoted. But I think when you get to leadership, you need to leave those skills behind you because now you're into learning agility and emotional intelligence. These are the skills you now need as a leader. And forget about, and this is why a lot of leaders micromanage. They keep going back into their area of technical proficiency, and they micromanage that. But if you become a leader, you're now dealing with people, it's aspirations, it's visioning, it's thinking for the future, it's getting people on the right, on the bus, moving in the one direction, a completely different skill set than when you were a technical competence um, earlier on in your career. And, and so, if you may allow me, because there's one very good question here on the chat. It was not posted in the Q&A, but I think it's also uh, following up on Dr. Taig's uh, just recent answer. That is the case. What is the worst quality a leader shall avoid at all costs and how to avoid being a bad leader? Or is there a bad leader at all? I, I, probably the worst one, I think, is not learning from your mistake. I think that is that is the worst thing because um, we're we're all going to make mistakes and and if you're not making mistakes, you're not stretching yourself enough. In my opinion, you're working within your comfort zone, and and I think every person will allow you to make a mistake, or they should allow you to make a mistake. But if you make the same mistake again and again, well, then I think you should be penalized. So I I say learning mistakes. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Harry. Uh, we have some more questions, a couple of questions which I'm reading around through. Uh, what should I pick it up? I think uh, another one is that we already talked about uh, emotional leadership as well, once you are trying to explain about it. Sorry, uh, I did. How emotional intelligence also falls under leadership. Could you repeat, please? Emotional Sorry. intelligence, I have to say. 
emotional intelligence, Dr. Tai. Oh, that, <laughs> that is the, yes, the je ne sais quoi. I, I think it is, it is key. You know, it's all about, it's all about your, your, your empathy. And, and we've covered that already. It's self-awareness. Now, I think emotional intelligence, the bedrock is self-awareness. Your self-awareness and your self-management. And that gives you your kind of self, um, looking after yourself. But there's another half to emotional intelligence, and this is the social awareness and the relationship management. And those give you empathy. But I think those four component parts make up emotional intelligence. But for me, the key is self-awareness. How can you change or relate to anybody if you're not aware of yourself, of your own areas of strength, your own areas for, for development? Because there's an old um, uh, sign outside the temple in, in Delphi in ancient Greece that was written thousands of years ago. And it, it, it says, know thyself. And I think that's true of any leader. You first have to know yourself before you can lead anybody. Hello. Uh, we have another question, uh, Dr. Thai, from Mr. Kareem. His context is that can the leaders be same at all the places, everywhere, in all the context? Or they need to be adaptable, looking at the context and place and situations in their leadership style, or more importantly, in their context around? Do you rate this quality as important one? And if yes, how important? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, uh, to me, uh, you know, situational leadership to me is, yep. is so, so important because, you know, there are times when, when you have to direct people, there are times when you're going to have to delegate people, there are times when you kind of coach people, when you support people. And I think the biggest mistake a lot of leaders make is they, they delegate. Just because a person is on your team for 15 years doesn't mean you delegate everything to them. Because to delegate a task to somebody, they have to have competence, but they also have to have commitment. And that commitment is made up of motivation and willingness to do the task. So they could be very, very high on competence, unquestionably so. But what's their commitment like? What's their motivation like? And their inspiration and confidence to do the task at hand. So you have to balance both sides. So the best leaders are the leaders that can move around and use an appropriate style to a given situation. And I think situational leadership is, is not work what you do for people, it's what you do with people. And the best leaders work with their people. Thank you. I think it was a very good question, actually. In fact, another one which I'm definitely uh, quite curious to ask you from Mr. Sayed, it was another interesting question we have. Uh, most of the time, people take the patient listening as the habit of the weakness. How do you gently handle it to overcome the situation to show it is a leadership trait and it's not a weakness? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, we're going back to listening. And um, I, if there's anything that frustrates me at meetings is when, when, when somebody comes out of a meeting and says, oh, Muhammad or Mary or uh, Irene wasn't interested. They said nothing at the meeting. Mm. And, and, you know, these, these could be introverts. Yep. And introverts don't like to speak on the spot. They like to reflect. They like to think about things. And they like to come back to it tomorrow. And so it frustrates me because usually at meetings, same people are continuously speaking. And a little bit of advice I, I try and give people on my leadership courses and, and the managers and leaders in training is, if at all possible in meetings, try to be the last to speak. Mm. And very often in meetings, you've got a lot of people um, and it's the same people, they come in and they talk and they talk and they talk, but they right. don't listen. So if you yeah. listen to what has been said, when you do speak, it's going to be far more informed. Oh, that's a very good uh, advice, Dr. Tai. <laughs> and some people pro yeah. prolong the meeting because so much talk without value or sense sometimes. Hmm? So speak the last during meetings. 
Peru. Okay, uh, how important, this question is from Mr. Sheikh over there, how important is to keep the stakeholders happy around the leader? I think stakeholder management is definitely, we, we have been learning about it throughout project management theories, lectures, certifications. I think everybody cannot disagree with it. But again, that's one of the truth is that you cannot make each and everybody happy around you at the same time. The leader, what should be done in the yeah. context? leadership good question very good question um i in in my 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 leadership programs i use a wonderful model by by chris rogers if any of you want to look at it and it's all about dynamic tensions mm -hmm. and it has to do with managing the tensions because i've alluded earlier on to you have to think of current but you have to think about the future and that is operational as opposed to strategic so you're it's like an elastic band you're being pulled both ways you're also being pulled between internal and external. And you alluded there to stakeholders. Let's focus on the external stakeholders. And it's all about differentiation, competitive positioning. Whereas on the other side, you've got your internal stakeholders. And that's focused on the internal people and the processes, integration, organizational capability. So at times, it's like changing the wheels on the car when the car is moving. You have to manage all of the tensions between current and future, internal and external, your internal people as opposed to your stakeholders, and your, your current operational things as opposed to your strategy. So it's a, there is no good answer, uh, answer to the question. I think you just have to manage all of the parts as best you can. And not to forget, when you change one part, it has an effect on the other. Whereas, for example, your your external future has to do with innovation, whereas your, your, your current external is all about achievement. You look at your internal current or your internal processes, and then your internal future is all about the well-being of your staff. So you're constantly being pulled in all directions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, we have a few last couple of questions. Let me try to grab them up. Uh, Few questions are ranging around innovation and over innovation in fact interestingly uh, okay how could the leader avoid falling for over innovation trap again i think it's all about goals that you're set you have to look at the strategic priorities of the company the kpis all of that but don't overstretch you have to stretch people but if you overstretch well you're not going to achieve anything and, you know, when giving goals, uh, my advice would be there's the law of diminishing returns. Usually, if you give between to any team between three and five goals, they will complete them well. But once you mm. go over five, you go between five and ten, nothing will be completed well. There'll be little mm. bits of everything. So mm. I think in small measures, focus, smart goals from the start with a verb increase production from have a baseline x to y by when now that's a smart goal because you can measure it. you can see how you're getting on increase reduce improve whatever from x your starting point to whatever and then by when you're putting the time factor in so that's your specific measurable attainable realistic time bound goals put together beautifully Thank you, sir. Thank you. One question uh, which is uh, pondering my mind is that in terms of emotion, again, so I'm very much intrigued into emotions. So uh, how to take command of your emotions being uh, in leadership role? Uh, as you talked about situational leadership, you talked about contextual leadership, you talked about emotional intelligence. So everybody is not at, this, at par in terms of handling emotion and controlling emotions or disseminating emotions more and wide. Yeah, so I, I think that before you can control and, and manage your emotions, you first have to become aware of them. So what I would propose there would be take some emotional intelligent instruments, EQI are one of those. And, you know, find out what are your triggers? What, what are your buttons? What, what gets you upset? What gets you annoyed? Because mm. you can't do anything about it until you can first identify it. And then when you identify it, now you can put strategies in place counteract when those things happen. 
Yes, and if I may say, we had a speaker before who talked about this uh, emotional uh, intelligence assessment, like what Dr. Taig is saying. So it is really a good one to have, give yourself a chance to go up through this assessment. So you're, you will also understand the situations, either being as a leader or being the follower. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Dr. Taig, as uh, Anchal is giving yeah. you the q and I'm actually engaging with the, your attendees here on the chat and they are thanking you a lot for this wonderful uh, a webinar. Thank you very much. I, I, I would, before leaving Irene, just like to say that um, a lot of the content, most of the content is taken from that wonderful book I spoke about this today. If you're interested in, in purposeful leadership, I, I would recommend you, you, you buy the book. It's called Become the Five Commitments of Purposeful Leadership by Mark Hannum. Mm -hmm. A very, very good book on that particular area of purposeful leadership. I also love servant leadership. I, I think that's Great time for servant leaders. Thank you. Thank you. I think wonderful. I think two last nuggets which you gave, very good for all of our attendees to read those books if they have really meaningful leadership, purposeful leadership they want to go through. Thank you so much, Dr. Thai. I think it was wonderful really listening to you around. A lot of questions were there. Thank you, audience, for posting those interesting questions to us where we could ponder them more deeper. Uh, I think uh, we are here to about the end of session now. Uh, before we end this session, definitely I would like to invite you for next webinar session, which we are going to host on 16th of February. Uh, and our speaker will be Dr. Ghani Mohde, who will speak about circular economy role in enhancing sustainability in construction projects. So I think uh, people who are into construction business or near about touch points, definitely they will love that webinar over there. So you went, you may visit the events page as well in order to learn more about it and to register yourself. The big shout out to all friends in the marketing team who have been there all in there to, to host and allow us to host such beautiful events and by their marketing media and relevant information on the social media on time and also on the PMI UA website. We close this webinar tonight, guys. I hope that everybody would have liked this particular webinar and would like to thank you all of your attendance and participation. We won't say a good night, of course, without saying your thank you to the rest of the PMI UAE chapter volunteers who have always been successful uh, hosting these webinars along with us, and then including our colleagues from membership, outreach, volunteering, finance, and governance. So until our next webinar, together with my colleague behind the camera, Oliver, Irene, Bavain, Joseph, and our events director, Rosanna, this is Anshil, wishing you all a pleasant evening ahead. God bless and join us back on the next webinar session at PMI UAE chapter series. Thank you so much. Good day. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much, Dr. Tai. We'll My just pleasure. read, thank we'll just thank read the thank you messages here in the chat. Thank you, Santosh, Michelle, Imran, Yel, Mohammed, Ibrahim, too much. Lori Bautista, Viju, Tanzil, Jacinta, Jigil. Okay, you, I'll leave you. Bye. Thank you, so Thank bye, you Dr. Tai. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye.